High Energy Physics from the University of Illinois, Urbana, in 1975. His thesis was on the modeling and analysis of an elementary particle experiment at Brookhaven National Lab. He spent the next seven years participating in experiments at Fermilab. In 1982, he joined AT&T Bell Labs in Naperville, working as technical support for telecom sales to the U.S. and other governments, including NATO. There is a lot more for to his bio, but I'm going to cut it short, otherwise we won't have time for his presentation. So welcome, right. Tom Robbins. Well, thank you. Do, do I need to use the microphone, or am I loud enough on my own? You in the back, you hear me? Okay. All right. Usually I don't need a microphone. So I want to... There. Okay. So I'm going to talk about Louvoir. Uh, and what IIT has contributed to it. Louvoir is a $15 billion effort uh, that was studied with, a, with about, with about a, a $20 million study going into the Decadal Survey in 2020. Uh, I'll steal one of my slides, Thunder, and point out that the Decadal Survey's top priority was a space telescope that looks very much like Louvoir. Um, it, the, uh, to start out, I'll tell you what we're talking about. It's a large ultraviolet optical and infrared surveyor. The point is that it covers <coughs> practically the entire electromagnetic spectrum that's of interest. Uh, you need far UV to, to measure the, the Balmer series of hydrogen and you want near infrared because some, some things get, uh, the, because distant galaxies and all get redshifted down into the infrared. Um, it's a 15 meter primary mirror, and that's this. It is a much bigger sun shield, and I will show how it evolves, how it, how it goes from a launch, a compact launch thing into its ultimate size. Uh, it has four instruments they share the primary mirror, and each one looks at a different portion of the overall field of view, so they all run simultaneously. However, when you point the system at a particular place, some of them may or may not have very interesting things in their field of view. Um, two of the instruments are point-like, and two of the instruments are very big field. Um, the key, one of the key points is it, they use ultra-stable structures, and that's where IIT's contribution comes in, which is why I underlined that. It has a high-precision coronagraph. The idea is to block the light from a nearby star and directly image planets. Moreover, the Eclipse instrument is able to do a spectrograph of each and every pixel. So it will, will be able to spec, do a spectrograph of the planet. And that's, that's of interest because that can tell you whether or not there's, bi, there's active biology going on in the planet. That is biology as we know it. There might be other things and, and uh, you know, they're doing the best they can. Um, it's room temperature. That's remarkable for a space telescope. They are going to heat the mirror to 270 Kelvin in order to uh, minimize various things. I won't, I won't go into the details. The idea is that the design is serviceable. Now, it's going to orbit at the Sun-Earth L2, which is very far away. It's like four times further than the moon. So it's unlikely that humans will serve it. They're thinking robotic service. <coughs> it will be a, com a community-driven facility, meaning anybody with stature in, in the field can propose uh, observing time. And Louvoir was hoping for a launch in the late 1930s, the decadal, or 2030s, the decadal survey implies it might mo be more like 2040. Um, one of the key things is that Louvoir builds upon investments made by the Hubble Space Telescope, the James Webb Space Telescope, the Roman Space Telescope, and numerous laboratory ground uh, and suborbital experiments. 
So it's not a pie in the sky. It's it's a uh, it's a evolution of things that have been done and have worked before. So here's the outline of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, a high level overview of the mission because after all astronomy is about what you can see and what you can do and so that's the mission. Then I'll talk about, talk about a high level overview of the spacecraft itself so you'll get some idea of what it can do. Um, I'll, I'll talk about the impact on the 2020 Decadal Survey, because that is going to guide the funding agencies over the next decade on how they allocate their funds. Um, I'll talk about IIT's contribution. It's precision metrology, which is being applied here to get ultra-rigid uh, structures with low mass, right? If you're gonna orbit this thing, it has to be low mass. Uh, and, and the way we do it is called the tracking frequency gauge and it can give position resolutions better than a picometer in the lab. And the challenge for us is to improve its technical readiness level so that we can fly it and, and, and use it in practice. And I want to point out, I'm a physicist, I am not an astronomer, so please remember that. Okay. <laughs> so here's the high level overview of the mission. The point is that it's a highly capable multi-wavelength observatory. They're trying to do everything. They want to be able to see distant galaxies, and they want to be able to see nearby planets, exoplanets. So it, it's very ambitious science goals, and the major one is to characterize the exoplanets and look for life, see if they're habitable or inhabited even by biology similar to we see out here on Earth. So in general, it's going to revolutionize many areas of space science. The ultra-fate and the ultra-distant universe is clearly important because of the large mirror. A 15 meter mirror wouldn't, you know, would barely fit in this room, and the sun shield for it could not possibly fit in this room. This thing is huge, okay? It will dramatically increase the sample size of exoplanets because it can see them directly, not only by monitoring the, uh, the intensity of starlight from a nearby star, but actually blocking the light from the star and looking with its, that is with its coronagraph, and looking for planets nearby. Um, and we'll be searching for biosignatures of, of uh, hab habitability. Um, so that, as I say, the, the first goal is search for life. The eclipse coronagraph will block out the starlight and let them directly image the planets, exoplanets, they believe that it's potentially applicable to about 50 Earth-like planets and many more that are not at all Earth-like. Um, and, and the amazing thing is this instrument can apply a spectrum, uh, can, can generate a spectrum for every pixel of the image. So if a planet only takes one or two pixels, there's still a good, good spectrum from it. Now, the other thing is, it is quite possible they may find no planets at all with any biological signatures. I mean, we don't know what, what's out there. There has never been an instrument that could see it so far, be on the ground or in space. And so, it's certainly possible that, you, that, that there's a null result. We haven't found, they haven't found any. Well, now you can statistically constrain this. You can learn quantitatively what's the likelihood of a earth-like planet having biology and and if there are, if none are found you can you can limit it to less than 10 percent um, I should mention there are at loop there are actually two different designs for Louvoir they're called a and B the a is the one I normally talk about it's a 15 meter mirror 
The B is essentially the same, except it's only an eight meter mirror. Um, it's less expensive, it's, it requires a less powerful launch vehicle. And, and that's why they, uh, they have, have put the two of them together. So here's some examples of, of how Louvoir can, can see distant ultra faint things. For a Z equals two galaxy of a billion solar masses, Hubble can sort of see it, the two Louvoirs can see it very well, and the extra large telescope, this is one proposed to be on Earth to be 39 meters, um, is, is in the same ballpark. But if it's only a million solar masses, Hubble doesn't even see it. The two Louvoirs are right on, the, the smaller one is right on the edge of seeing it, the larger one can see it reasonably well. Um, the other thing they want to do is uh, look at the diversity of exoplanets. There are lots of exoplanets. And Louvoir, with its coronagraph and its eclipse instrument that can, can give you a spectrum of each, they can, they can uh, characterize planets that aren't Earth-like at all. They can directly image them, and they can measure the orbits, and they'll do so for hundreds all types of planets um, and and the point is that they that exoplanets are really faint but but the eclipse instrument can do ultraviolet to near infrared spectral characterization of of this whatever population they find there's a there will be a new window into galaxy evolution um, if you look at the different redshifts as a function of redshift, how um, how bright is it? I'll, I'll come back to that later. But you can see that Louvoir has has uh, sensitivity much better than any of it, any of the uh, alternates. Um, the HDI, this is the high definition imager. Um, it's it's another amazing, it's going to be uh, probably a five gigapixel camera coupled to this 15 meter uh, mirror. And, and they can be, it can see anywhere from the local group all the way back to ionization. So, or reionization, uh, which is really quite amazing. Uh, star and planet formation will be a focus of a different aspect. This is the LUMOS instrument. This one can, can give you more detailed spectrum of many objects in the field of view. And again, it's mostly far UV, which it, it, is what you need to, uh, to measure abundances of hydrogen. That's the Balmer series. But, but it goes through optical wavelengths, so you can do m most of the interesting small molecules uh, of the form planets. Um, so it has a three foot by two foot survey field. It will be probably about a five gigapixel uh, imager. And, and the point is, if you have ground a ground-based telescope with adaptive optics, you can only look at one star at a time because the, adapt the adaptive optics have to focus right on that star. Whereas this will can do every object in a huge field. Is, would that be, yeah. Would those little marks be uh, three arc minutes by two arc minutes? Uh, I don't. I don't. Don't know. It's astronomy. Okay, but I dare say this thing will be <laughs> very capable. Beyond that, okay, as I say, I'm not an astronomer and I don't have those, those facts in my head. Also, it's a telescope orbiting at L2, it can view the solar system. So some of the observing time will be doing that. Um, the interesting thing to me is here they're, they're looking at ejections from, I think this is Enceladus, but I'm not sure, and it didn't actually say. But 
but but the point is Hubble can't even see the moon itself whereas the two Louvars can and have much higher resolution for the ejecta so this will, this will be a game changer in monitoring the solar system. So I'd like to move on. Uh, if anyone have any more other questions, uh, feel free to interrupt, by the way. Uh, that helps, actually. Um, so I'll now talk about the spacecraft. So the primary thing to know is it will be at Sun Earth L2. Now that's an unstable equilibrium anything that wants to stay there has to have station keeping. But they choose L2 because it's very light station keeping and a small amount of propellant can keep you there for a long time. For instance, the James Webb is there orbiting L2. You don't sit at the point, you orbit it. And, and James Webb arrived with such precision that they expected to have enough uh, propellant for 20 years instead of the design 10. The design 10 uh, took in worst cases of how accurate it would be injected and, and things like that. And just the fact that it was so precise in arriving at L2 saved propellant that would have been necessary to inject it into the orbit and so they have a lot more propellant available for station keeping. Um, currently there are three uh, objects, telescopes, I'm, instruments, I'm not sure what to call them. Uh, the James Webb is the most uh, most obvious, and I believe Gaia is, is almost end of life and is going to be leaving soon. There are a half dozen future probes that are, that are intended to go to L2. Uh, not all of them will be built, but uh, some may be. But space is large, and even though they're orbiting L2, the presence of other objects isn't going to be a problem. As I said earlier, Louvoir is huge. This is a 56 meter square sunshade. It would not fit in this room. Okay? The 15 meter primary mirror would fit in this room, I think, but not a whole lot of extra space. Uh, so it has a, a support structure for, for the secondary mirror and the the aft optics is right on the center line. Behind the uh, support frame are the, are the four instruments, Pollux, Eclipse, HDI, and Lumos. And there's other stuff here, like the spacecraft bus. This is what brings power from the solar arrays through the sun shield into the instruments and the, uh, the aiming. Uh, components. Primary mirror will be maintained at 270k and I won't go into details why they've chosen that but several of the instruments will be radiatively cooled well below that, more, more like 100k uh, in order to improve their signal to noise ratio. So Louvoir has to fit in the SLS Block 2 launch vehicle that's a launch vehicle that has never flown. It's in design. Um, and so there's some concern about that. Um, where's my cursor? There we go. Okay, so here come, that's the solar panels. That's the sun shield. So the solar panels are on the sun side. The instrument is on the back. Here's the secondary mirror unfolding. And this is the primary mirror. These are the aft optics, as they call them. And the whole thing can now point and rotate and do, do all the things you need to do. Normally, the sun shield will be perpendicular to the line to the sun. And since it's orbiting L2, it's never in Earth's shadow. Okay? But they've also designed it so they can tilt the sun shield up to 45 degrees. So if you, if you want to see something that is closer to the sun than 90 degrees, you have to do that. Of course, you can, you can wait until the Earth goes around its orbit uh, and, and puts whatever object you're looking more, more perpendicular to the sun shield. But 
for many things you want to watch watch objects as they evolve and so being able to do that is viewed as a, as a big plus. So here are some general characteristics. As I said, it will be a community-driven observation program. So people can propose uh, time on it. It's expected to be serviceable, but as I say, it's most likely to be robotic servicing. Uh, it's the Sun Earth L2 orbit. Late 2030s or early 2040s is, is the launch date. They say a five year prime mission, that's what most space telescopes say, and they hope for more. Okay, like James Webb is hoping for 20 years now. Uh, it's diffraction limited, and, uh, and it can reach 45 degrees away from the sun. Uh, it has a tracking speed of 60 milliarc seconds per second, uh, twice what the James Webb can do. I don't know what that means. I mean, I imagine that's how fast it can, can move, but, but whether that's good, bad, or indifferent, I don't know. My guess is it's probably pretty good <laughs> because these guys are not fooling around, right? So here's a summary of their four instruments. The Eclipse is the coronagraph. It, it goes from far UV to near infrared. Um, and it has, as I say, it, it has imaging spectroscopy that can put a spectroscope on every pixel. HDI is the wide field imager. It's three foot by two foot. Um, and they expect it to be somewhere between two and five gigapixels. And my guess is it'll be near the upper end of that because why not? Um, by the, you know, a decade from now, a five gigapixel camera probably won't be very difficult. I mean, it's, it's not impossible today, so. LUMOS is a multi-object spectrograph and, and can image in the far UV. Um, so this does not go into, uh, it does not go very far into the infrared. And then Pollux is a point source ultraviolet spectrometer. And the reason they're focusing on ultraviolet is that there aren't any up in, in space right now. And the, the hydrogen series is in the far UV, and so they expect to learn more about uh, abundances of the various hydrogen isotopes. This does po polarization, so it's, uh, it's also a, no a new window on that. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the impact on the decadal survey. The primary purpose of the Louvoir survey was to propose an ambitious program, but include decision rules, decision points, and contingencies. And the decadal survey will be guiding the funding agencies in their allocation of funds through the 2020s, which is the, the time that, that Louvoir will be designed and, and started to be built. Um, the highest priority from the decadal survey was an infrared optical UV large telescope. Well, that's just the opposite order of the way Louvoir said it. Um, optimized for observing habitable exoplanets in general astrophysics. And this is two of their uh, five priority areas. Pathways to Habitable Worlds, and Unveiling the Drivers of Galaxy Growth. Their, as I say, their description is very close to Louvoir B, uh, with a similar mission cost of around $11 billion. And they did list, among large strategic missions, they listed Louvoir B first. So I think it's a, a pretty safe bet that Louvoir is going to move forward. Whether it retains that name is something else uh, I won't go into. So I'll, I'll talk m more about what's near and dear to my heart. As I say, I'm not an astronomer, and everything up till now has been about astronomy. Okay? So I know enough to be dangerous. But now I'll talk about what IIT is contributing to the overall Louvoir mission. And remember, the key thing here is 
ultra rigid structures in, in the primary mirror, in the secondary mirror support, and in, in the overall pointing, and especially in the alignment of the coronagraph. All of that needs great stability. So their requirement is picometer accuracy. A picometer is 10 to the minus 12 meters. And this is beyond the state of the art right now. They're actually requiring four picometers, which is still about an order of magnitude beyond the state of the art. However, IIT and our collaborators have a system that can reach below a picometer. And that's how, that's how we got uh, into Louvoir and, uh, and, and have been given a grant to work on it. The, uh, the idea of making rigid primary mirror with very strong weight limits, and of course anything at the picometer level is hard because nobody does it now. <laughs> okay. So the idea is to use piezoelectric actuators and precision metrology and put it in a feedback loop that will con control the positions of the individual segments. But, but it's a daunting task. Each, seg each, segment, each, each segment has six edges, and each edge has six degrees of freedom. So there are 120 segments, 318 boundaries, and that would be 1,900 channels. That's a lot of channels of precision metrology and piezoelectric actuators. Okay. Um, and, and there will be additional channels. They'll surely want fiducials out to the secondary mirror. They'll want them for the coronagraph. So, you know, think 2,000 channels of this stuff. Um, right now, we have one. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's an effort as I say, to improve the technical readiness level of the system. So here's sort of the way you can you do this. Here we are. Um, there are three coordinates: are R, S, and T. R is normal to the mirror at the boundary. So each boundary has a normal. The, of course, the different R's around the mirror are pointing in somewhat different directions because the mirror is, is not flat. But locally, this is the R direction, normal to the mirror at the boundary, and so we're looking at looking we're looking at edgewise, and, and and looking for this. Okay, that's that's how these these two um, measure. And the, the, to get the other degrees of freedom, you actually put six different measurements and actuators, uh, and this is one proposed way of doing that. Uh, so I'll talk about our tracking frequency gauge. This is the, the device that actually measures to the picometer level. Um, here's our, what happened? Oh, yeah. So it's a laser-based optical system. Uh, it can, can measure changes in distance with better than picometer resolution. And it can do absolute distance with about a nanometer resolution. Um, it's unusual for a single system to be able to do both. Mo most systems only, only, only look at variations. But due to the structure of the optics, we can also measure the absolute distance. Meaning, if it's 10 meters, we can say 10.00312 meters. As opposed to it's wiggling back and forth with a, at a few picometers. So it was originally conceived by Phillips and Riesenberg at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, and they were looking at uh, something completely different, a, uh, a test of the equivalence principle on the ground. Uh, they got a patent in 1995. Um, Due to funding limitations, they transferred all their lab to IIT. Um, we got interested in this and started collaborating with them, and they needed to move, and they came to IIT. So Bob Riesenberg is one of our collaborators, and Jim Phillips is a consultant for us.
Same idea, a, a single light ray is split, it goes one 90 degrees to one arm and straight ahead to the other arm and then comes, comes back and the same beam splitter combines those two into the photo detector. So the beam launcher is here, the, the angled beam splitter is here, the short arm goes back that way, is only about four inches long, and the long arm goes all the way out here and comes back. And so the difference between the two arms is just about half a meter. And, uh, and that gives us uh, excellent properties. Over here we have a Fabry-Perot optical cavity. Uh, the purpose of a Fabry-Perot a Fabry has two mirrors pointed at each other and you run the light down, down the center of it. And so the light bounces back and forth. And the challenge for a Fabry-Perot is to get very high reflectivity in the mirrors so you get many, many bounces. Okay, our, uh, our Fabry-Perot has a finesse of around 130. What that means is effectively the light is bouncing back and forth 130 times. To compare it to the Michelson, the Michelson just has a out and back, it has a finesse of two. It also turns out the higher finesse of a cavity we have, the more accurately we can measure things. So, we'll, and, and I'll come back to that. Um, other things we have here on the table, uh, it's a challenge to match optics into the Fabry Perot, so we have a lot here. It's trivial to match into the Michelson. Uh, we have a constant temperature box here, which keeps most of the fab fibers at a constant temperature. Turns out, fibers are pretty sensitive to temperature, and they vary their optical path length with temperature, and that can confuse things. Uh, this is an amazing box. It, uh, it holds the temperature at 90 degrees Fahrenheit, plus or minus 0 0.001 Fahrenheit. That's far better than I ever expected when I designed it. Um, here are the lasers. There's two of them. One, two, and they have the PDH controllers on the top. And I'll show you where that goes in a minute. But the point is, they're very small. Okay? It turns out this box containing the lasers is enormous compared to the laser itself. So, and it's just this small little thing here. One other thing I'll point out, here are two flashlights, because we often have to turn out the lights in order to, uh, to see the beam. Uh, we, these are infrared lasers, and we need to use viewing cards that convert infrared into visible light, and they don't do it so well. So we often have to turn out the lights, so we need a flashlight to, to maneuver around the room when we do that. So here's the laser. This is about five inches by nine inches. This is the laser itself. That's a laser diode. And all of this around here is support and safety uh, electronics to protect the laser from glitches. Uh, the lasers are very sensitive and it's really easy to punch a hole in it and just destroy it. Um, in this box I also put some monitoring. Uh, this is a this is a microcontroller, an, an Arduino type microcontroller with a couple of ADCs, and it's just monitoring the laser, all the different operating points of the laser. The PDH controller we use, and I'll tell you what that means in just a minute, uh, is a red pataya. Oh, I'm just going to bring one. It's, it's this big. So <laughs> it's just, and most of that, the only thing, the F, this, heatsink is covering a, a single chip that has both an FPGA and a microcontroller on it. It's an ARM microcontroller running Linux. Um, the FPGA is what does all the digital signal processing to be the controller. And the microcontroller just sets its parameters. It, the microcontroller is not in the optics or the feedback path. So here's a diagram of what the TFG actually is. We start with two corner cubes and you mount them on the distance you want to measure. 
So I'll call that L, capital L, and this is this is what we're measuring. Okay? You start with a laser and you you make sure that one of the faces of the corner cubes is really a beam splitter. It's probably about a 90 to 10, 90%, 10% beam splitter. And the light goes around and around in the corner cubes, and some of it comes back out into a photo detector. The photo detector feeds this PDH lock controller. PDH stands for, um, where is it? Oh, I forgot. <laughs> in the middle. Uh, Pound Draver Hall. Uh, they're guys from from MBS and uh, now NIST. We invented it. Um, and the point is that the controller. Uh, you, you first have to know that the laser can vary its wavelength with this control voltage. And the second thing you need to know is an optical cavity resonates. When, when two times its length is equal to some n times the lambda of the laser, the wavelength of the laser. n can be large. In our, in our Michelson, n is about a million. So it's OK. The point is that the controller keeps the laser at a resonance. So if the distance varies a little bit, the controller will vary the wavelength of the laser. And of course, varying the laser, the wavelength, also varies the frequency. And that's what matters here. Because we take 10% of the laser and we feed it into another photo detector. And we heterodyne it with a reference laser. So, so as, as the distance varies, the heterodyne in this photo detector varies. We can put a, a simple counter on it and run that into our data acquisition. And all we have to do is count the, uh, the cycles per second of the heterodyne. In fact, that's, that's one of the general things, that if you, if you want to make a very accurate measurement, you want to somehow manage to measure a frequency, because you can measure frequency far better than you can measure anything else. In our case, the lasers are about 100 terahertz, and we are measuring at a few few tens of hertz. So that's like 10 to the 15th, part in 10 to the 15th for our measurement. So as I said, when you vary the, the control voltage of the laser, you change its frequency or, and its wavelength. So this is using our unequal arm Michelson interferometer. And this was just a sweeping the laser in the Michelson. So we're, we're measuring the response of the interferometer. And as you can see, it has minima and maxima repeating. These are the different fringes of the Michelson. Just the way Michelson and Morley counted fringes when they rotated their system, we can count fringes when we move it back and forth. We don't rotate ours, so that's not the purpose. But we can, we can set our system to lock to any one of these fringes. Um, so there are 14 here within the, within the range of this particular sweep. And the other thing is that the laser power also increases with the voltage. So you can see that the peaks between the fringes are slowly rising. That's just, there's more power on this side than there is here. So that's, that's just an effect of the laser diode. So here's the, the bottom line, so to speak. How well does the TFG do? We, we characterize it with Allen deviation. And what Allen deviation is telling you is, at any given point, if you average for this amount of time, that's the sigma you will have in your measurement. The, that is uh, the standard deviation of your measurement. So, more averaging time means you're averaging more samples, and it should go like 1 over the square root of n, which is what this is. Down here, oh, and this is one picometer right here. Okay. And down here is where the uh, statistics of averaging start competing with 1 over f noise. And 
this mess <coughs> is due to 1 over F noise. The LUVAR requirement is way up here. So as I say, this significantly exceeds the LUVAR requirements. So that's basically the end of my talk. Uh, in summary, this, the LUVAR study was intended to provide input to the 2020 Decadal Survey. And so the study itself ended in early 2020 as that survey started. Uh, COVID slowed everything down and, and for various reasons there is still some money and some grant left in that and IIT is still working on this. Um, the, the LUVAR study really met, the, met that goal very well. Uh, the recommended highest priority is very much like a LUVAR space telescope. Now their mission goals require an order of magnitude improvement in the inner segment stability and the coronagraph positioning and the secondary mirror positioning. And that is really beyond the current state of the art by about an order of magnitude. But our TFG is poised to meet that requirement. Uh, we will be working on it with our collaborators to improve its technical readiness level so it can be deployed. So, thank you. Uh, questions? Yes? Yeah. So on that graph, the previous slide, uh, where you're comparing to the requirement, so how close is anybody else to that? Um, you said there are there are two other uh, systems vying for this. One of them is capacitive as a capacitive gauge. Basically, they they put put two capacitor plates on the thing to be measured on the distance to be measured, and by uh, as the capac as the plates move up, apart, the capacitance varies. They are, I believe, up in the 10 to 20 picometer range. The other one is also a laser uh, laser measuring gauge. It measures the phase difference of a fixed laser beam between mirrors that are on the on the distance to be measured. And I'm not sure where they are, but I don't think they meet the requirements yet. So, so is, is this similar to how the LIGO and Virgo type detectors are? Okay, LIGO uses two Fabry Pro interferometers, one oriented like this and one oriented like this, and they meet at one point. Okay, so it's kind of a very enhanced Michelson interferometer because the Fabry Pro uh, give them give give them Im improved resolution. Um, they go to great length. Their arms are four kilometers long. Okay, ours is half a meter. <laughs> All right. Um, one of the things they do is they use a hundred watts of laser. We use twenty milliwatts. So, so they have much, much higher power. They have to uh, actively cool their mirrors because of that, and they have to um, support each mirror against seismic. Uh, earthquakes, micro earthquakes. Um, so LIGO is in some sense the world's most sensitive uh, earthquake detector, but it's it's designed in such a way that that when when a gravitational wave goes by, the gravitational wave in one dimension extends and in the other dimension contracts, and they subtract the two Fabry Perot's from each other to to intensify that. And because of all the seismic backgrounds, they have two. They have one in in um, Louisiana and one in Washington State. And you know how far apart they are, you know gravitational waves move with the speed of light. So you can tell if a, if a potential candidate in each appears you can look at the time difference between them and know whether whether it's possible. And moreover, from that, if they if they came at equal time, you would say the source is up there. If this one comes earlier than that, you say it's over there. And so they have pointing ability. The adding Virgo to it in Italy uh, made a big improvement in their ability to identify the direction. 
So they're doing things completely different. They're not trying to measure the distance here. They're trying to measure the gravitational waves. So I just, I happen to know quite a bit about LIGO. That's all. <laughs> yes? Those um, 1908 little actuators, I think you call them, mm -hmm. is there an expectation that some of them will fail or degrade oh, certainly. in the course of the... Certainly. And um, how much does that affect the performance the, of the mirror then? The, by measuring six degrees of freedom, but you know, between a pair of plates, they can do this, they can do this, they can rotate in, in each direction. So there's actually six degrees of freedom. By measuring all six, when you, when you think about it, this plate and this plate co are constrained. So you don't really need to measure all six degrees of freedom at every one. And in fact, simulations have shown you really only need to measure four. And, and even that provides many constraints on the overall shape of the mirror to, and, and you know, with the accuracy required. <coughs> So the expectation is to measure all six, and when they all work, you have a lot more redundancy. When some of them fail, you have less. But the idea would be, hopefully, to have enough redundancy that, he, that the failures don't prevent you from, from keeping the mirror rigid. That's all. Okay, thank you. That's a good question. Yes? So uh, to what degree is this uh, international effort? From, and, from oops, like I'm gonna, this, uh, I'm gonna uh, kill yes, some. Uh, computers here. How much is this an international effort? Right now, Louvoir is strictly U.S. and the decadal survey is strictly U.S. But one of the uh, instruments was being designed by, I believe, an Italian group. Um, so it's, so the Louvoir study was only funded in the U.S. but, uh, but they're taking uh, contributions internationally. I dare say that will change. I dare say that, like other major systems, like the Dune experiment at Fermilab, the ITER experiment in, um, in France, these are big international collaborations. And I dare say the next space telescope will be so big that, that they will want uh, international participation, mostly money. <laughs> yes? Um, the, uh, y you're, you're trying to raise this, uh, this system of the technical readiness ladder, uh, mm -hmm. so it's, you know, it's, it's in a, a laboratory right now. Yes. Uh, but I'm, uh, I'm wondering how, in, in your imagination, if, if this thing is ready to go, and if, if you believe it can work for 25 years reliably in space, and whatever, I, how does, what does it look like if it's on the telescope? I mean, are there, mm -hmm. where, where, is, where is the sense, do you have to have 1,900 gadgets or the, okay. the, our, our, the sensor, where's the sensor on the mirror and what happens? Right, well right now we have a proposal in for additional funding to make two, okay? And the improvements on those two will be they'll, they'll be Fabry-Perot interferometers with a finesse of around 20, which is about what you would do when you fly, if you flew it. Um, we will also put it in vacuum, because right now ours is in air. Turns out our system, it, it's really quite amazing. We're in the basement of a, of a building at IIT that used to house a nuclear reactor. Now it was a test reactor, it was a whole five watts nuclear reactor, and they, they dismantled it in the late 60s. So, you know, the whole area is, is, is safe, but it was very well founded. The, uh, I don't know how thick the floor is, but it's enormous. The, one block to the east and one block to the west, there are, there's the red line and the green line. These are elevated trains in Chicago, okay? Two-thirds of a block to the west is a metro line. Um, I don't know, 100 yards to the east is State Street, okay, with its trucks and everything. We don't see any of that, which is just utterly flabbergasting. Most, I don't, I don't know if you know this, but Michelson and Morley at Case Western, what they did is they made 
a uh, concrete pillar that went all the way down to bedrock and was completely disconnected from the rest of the building. Wow. And that's where they put their interferometer. They went to great lengths to isolate it. Okay. We did essentially nothing. We just put our optics table on the concrete floor and, and that was good enough. And we are considerably more sensitive than Michelson and Morley. So somehow we just lucked into this. So, so putting it in vacuum is one aspect of improving our technical readiness level. Having a couple channels will allow us to compare them. And probably the next step after that is to build 20 or something like that. Um, in, right now, our system is pretty expensive. It, it takes a laser per channel and it takes a, a controller per channel. Turns out the laser is about $2,000, the controller is about $500. Um, the photo detector is about $500. And all the miscellaneous stuff is a couple hundred. So, so we're looking at roughly $3,000 a channel right now. Well, if you're going to build 2,000 of them, okay, that's Six million dollars. Okay, out of a out of a budget of of eleven billion dollars, that's not outrageous. That's not impossible. But it is the the thing is that the way we put stuff together right now is floppy, and you don't want that in a space telescope. So one of the other things we will be working on in in our next go around is integrated optics. Um, Turns out we're actually working with uh, Lockheed Martin the company, and they have a, a fairly advanced system of of optical, I don't know, integ integration. So so they could put the laser, the mirror, and the one of the mirrors for the for the cavity, and the photo detector, and all and all the optics in a little thing about like this. And it would be just, it would be solid, right? It's basically a piece of glass with, uh, with optical, optical channels etched in it. Um, they're not quite etched, that's the wrong word. They do it by, by varying the index of refraction. But the whole, it ends up being essentially a solid block in which they mount the laser, they mount the photo detector, they mount the mirrors, and, and it's rigid and solid and and will be much more reliable and much less expensive than all the falderol that we bought. So working in the future to, get, to improve the technical readiness level is a lot of work and it will take five years at least, I think. Um, but on the scale of the, of the Louvoir, that's okay. They won't, be, they won't start construction for at least five years. And by then, we ought to have a system that's ready. That's, that's, our, that's our current plan, anyway. And so this turns into, uh, like, a couple thousand little boxes, each, each with the job of measuring across the boundary between a mirror yeah. and one of the other important uh, mm -hmm. things you want to measure. Okay. Right. So, you know, we won't build thousands of them until we're actually deploying, okay? But we probably, we will certainly build 20 and probably build 100. Um, and by the time we're doing that, we don't want to do it like we did here. We want to do it with these integrated optics things so that, so that we don't have critical alignment uh, issues. That, that you basically end up with a thing, you aim at a corner cube over there and you're measuring the distance to that corner cube. And corner cubes have the advantage that, that it's really easy to hit them and you don't need to have them, a corner cube doesn't need to be aligned. Do, do you know what a corner cube is optically? No? A corner cube is, is three, three mirrors at right angles. I, can't, I don't have three hands, but there are three mirrors at right angles, and any optics beam that comes in and bounces off all three of them goes back at exactly the same angle it came in. So that, that's independent of how the corner cube itself is oriented relative to the beam. The only requirement is that it hit all three sides so, and, and not hit any of the seams, okay? But, but that generally gives you quite a lot of uh, 
of slop in how you align the thing. So having one integrated package with one corner cube in it that puts a laser beam out and you just have to put a corner cube at the place where you want it and now you measure the distance between them. Okay? That, that is, that's the vision. We haven't done it yet, but that's the vision. Probably what we'll do to start is not do the integrated optics, but rather do some, uh, oh, what's the word? We'll, we'll, we'll build it with, uh, with a 3D printer and, and put things together that way. The point being to reduce the, the difficulties of alignment. Other questions? Yes? Stated a launch date of 2040, which is a long, long way away, right? Long way away, yes. So it seems to me a lot of this technology, at least structurally, can be leveraged from the web, right? Um, what What are the major factors preventing this from going on sooner? I think the major factor is funding. That's it. That's. I think. I think some of the instruments have challenges. Uh, remember, Eclipse wants to put a spectrograph on each and every pixel of its image. I don't happen to know how many in, how many pixels there are, but there are surely thousands. Um, so I, I don't know the readiness of any of those instruments. Um, I just sort of take it on faith that the people designing them know what they're doing and are not proposing something that won't work. They're pushing the boundary of what's been done now, but maybe not too far. Sort of like we are, okay? We're pushing the boundary of what we've done, but not too far. So yeah, 15 million is hard to get just with the US, why not you know, spread it around? Yes, yes, as I say, funding, funding is definitely a limitation. Any other questions? Sir, how many people work with you and all of the team is right here yeah. nearby or they are in different part of America? Um, how many of the people work with you? As a team? How, how many people are working on LUVAR? Yeah. Oh, it's all over the country, all over the U.S. And there's a team in Italy also. Um, they're working on one specific instrument, okay? Um, our little piece was funded by University of Florida. They, they were our, they've been our collaborator. They're the ones that worked on the FPGA programming and, uh, and the digital controller, okay? They were funded by Lockheed Martin in California um, because Lockheed Martin got a small subcontract on this study to work to work on the rigid uh, the rigidity of the structures the overall the overall uh, study was somebody else I forget who but one of the big defense contractors that works with NASA all the time um, wasn't Lockheed Martin they were a small piece of this but to us, that's huge, right? It turns out there are just four of us working at IIT, and uh, and the, the Lockheed Martin team was, I think, on the order of 100 people. And as I say, it was a small part of this study. So this this was a 20 million dollar study over two years. So if you can wait till 2040, um, there will be a lot of interesting astronomy going on. <laughs>